we had a lot of fun going and finding some foods that you recommend in your book. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to talk a little bit about your approach and the five things we should think about as we're building a metabolically positive meal. To create a really simple framework in the in the book, the Good Energy Eating Plan, it was really prompted from just seeing so many thousands of people in the Levels community and my social media community who just feel so confused about what to eat. Like, am I supposed to be vegan? Am I supposed to be carnivore, paleo, keto, Mediterranean? It's so overwhelming. 80% of Americans are confused about nutrition, which is astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's especially astonishing because the more research that's published on nutrition, the more confused Americans mm -hmm. are. So let's keep it really simple. And my framework is really focused on like, we've got these 40 trillion cells in our body or more, and they need certain things to function properly. So how do we match what the food can give us with what the cells need? Because when that matching process happens well, often a lot of our symptoms will kind of melt away and we'll feel really good. So five of the key things that I believe, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, that I really think can help the body do well if we try and incorporate them in almost every meal is a really good fiber source, a healthy protein source, an omega-3 source, a probiotic source, and an antioxidant source. So then the key is actually having a mental model of what are your favorite things in each of those categories mm -hmm. and just making sure they're in your kitchen so it becomes almost like mixing and matching. So for me, some of my favorite omega-3 sources are chia seeds, basil seeds, hemp seeds, salmon, sardines, mackerel. Those things are all shelves, you know, canned fish, wild caught fish and seeds and nuts all in the pantry. So I always have those available to top a salad. Not necessarily expensive. No. no, you can get beautiful can of sardines and extra virgin olive oil for $2.99 at the store. And that has like 35 grams of protein, almost 2000 milligrams of omega threes, various micronutrients and vitamins. And so that's a great, so just have them there. For antioxidants, really, it's like any colorful fruit or mm -hmm. vegetable, plus spices, tea, coffee, and unsweetened cacao. So have those around. Those are going to be great antioxidant sources. Spices are actually one of the highest at antioxidant sources on planet Earth per, by gram. And so cooking with spices, dried spices, is a great way to get antioxidants. I learned in writing the book that the highest antioxidant nut is pecans. So keeping... Welcome to Texas. Welcome to Texas. <laughs> and it, it's like way higher than most other nuts, which is incredible. And then fiber sources. I love all beans, all legumes, chia seeds, basil seeds again, hemp seeds. Most nuts and seeds have a lot of great fiber. Um, what about fruits? You know, fruit is fairly low in fiber. Mm -hmm. The highest fiber fruit is raspberries, mm -hmm. and that's about eight grams per cup, which is awesome. But I would say, you know, I think we're really depleted in fiber in our culture. The average Clearly. American's getting about 12 grams of fiber. I aim for 50 grams or more a day. And truly, it's just about knowing what the best sources are and keeping them in your kitchen. So one really great way to get a lot of fiber. For me, I have tons of canned organic beans in my pantry. Of course, you could cook them in the pressure cooker. You could do them yourself. But for, for mm -hmm. all of us who are so busy, canned beans are fine. You don't want to mm -hmm. have any extra stuff in there. It's just They're basically beans. Salads. They're so great. So every Monday, I take three or four cans of beans, which will be about 150 grams of fiber total. And I d uh, put take the can top off. I put them in the colander. I wash Me them. Too. I put them in Tupperware. Because then you don't have to do that all week. Mm -hmm. You just do it once. Yes. And then quarter cup on a salad. Put a little bit on the side of my eggs. They can go on anything. And so just having them at the ready is key. I also keep jars of chia seeds, hemp seeds, and flax seeds on the counter yeah. so that when I'm making that salad or that chia pudding, you just put a couple on top. Um, so it's just really having them accessible. So that's fiber. Probiotic sources, for me, my absolute favorite is sauerkraut. So just having a big Costco has incredible, gigantic um, containers of wild brine sauerkraut. We actually, the research has shown that we want this is wild, but ideally six servings of probiotic foods per day for optimal um, gut, gut health. health. Mm -hmm. That is more than most people can do. So I would just say start with like two or three servings. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people think it's like just a tiny bit of sauerkraut. We want to get that quarter cup out and put a huge amount on our salad. That's going to be a tough sell. It's tough. Yeah. So for easier things, yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah. Great. Tell us a little bit about yogurt because yogurt is yeah. complicated. Yogurt's complicated. The key thing you want to do with yogurt is find it that has basically one ingredient, which is just, Protein. you know, if, which is, well, and just basically milk as the main ingredient, or if you're doing a non-dairy yogurt, as few ingredients as possible. Maybe it's almonds and water and one or two other ingredients. So but, get the plain yogurt and get your own fruit. Well, plain is actually not good enough. A lot of plain yogurt is actually sweetened. And so you want it to specifically say 
unsweetened. So this says zero added sugar. That is very, very important. The only ingredient in this entire thing is cultured nonfat milk. So this is perfect. And then they also have the cultures in here. But then you look at another yogurt that looks potentially healthy. So this well, says organic. Well, it's calling itself organic. Organic, and it's got vanilla bean, dairy-free, all these words. But it has about like 30 ingredients on the back. You know, it's got cane sugar. It's got tapioca starch, pectin, natural flavors, guar gum, locust bean gum, agar, like just things you just don't need. So this is an unsweetened one ingredient yogurt. This is gonna be amazing. And you wanna make sure it has the live and active culture. So this is actually listing the bacteria that's in there. So that's great. And then my third favorite probiotic source is actually, it's called Kvass. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially like a low sugar kombucha. Kombucha now at the store has basically become soda. It has like yes. 15 to 20 grams of sugar in it. They've realized that people like kombucha and so they made it palatable to the American taste and now it's filled with sugar. So, so kombucha is usually made with fermenting fruit and tea and sugar. Kvass is actually just fermenting beets and water basically. So the carbohydrate source is the beet and it has no sugar. And you can find that online. Well, that's kind of a sweet. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. But they, they ferments a lot of the sugar. So just make sure to read the labels. But yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, kvass, and just looking at your labels for kombucha. I would say don't buy a kombucha with over five grams of sugar for the whole bottle. Um, that's a good rule of thumb. So that's probiotics and then protein. You know, protein is such an amazing macronutrient because it makes us feel full. And I think a lot of women especially are probably underdoing protein. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one that we really do want to prioritize for satiety mechanisms and for stimulating the maintenance of muscle mass, which of course is like our metabolic armor. It's going to take up glucose. It's going to release healthful hormones called myokines. And so I aim for about 30 grams of protein per meal. And so it's just like kind of knowing your protein sources. So mm -hmm. each egg has six grams of protein generally, you know, knowing that like a the chicken breast is probably going to have between 25 and 30 grams of protein. Um, a quarter of a package, a one pound package of ground beef is going to have about um, 26, 25, 26 grams of protein. So kind of just having mental math of how to get, how to put together your... At every meal. At every meal. Yeah. Um, and that's going to keep you so full. And then of course, if you're using protein powders, just looking for the ones that have the least ingredients possible. Yeah. So like maybe... Um, just one or two ingredients and no added sugar and no natural flavors. So that's kind of how I like to put together meals as fiber, antioxidants, probiotics, um, healthy protein and omega-3s. And really it just comes down to a lot of like mixing and matching and having sources of each of those at the ready. And then the three things that I talk about keeping out of all our mm -hmm. meals in the book. <laughs> yeah, this one we have to talk about for a, for a little bit. It's really simple. It's three things. It's ultra-processed grains, ultra-processed sugars, and ultra-processed industrial seed oils. Um, and so these are things that are basically the main three ingredients in almost all packaged and processed foods that we're seeing in the country. Mm -hmm. Almost 70% of our calories now are coming from ultra-processed foods. And the base of an ultra-processed food is ultra-processed grains, ultra-processed sugars, and ultra-processed industrial seed oils. And so if we actually just start by getting rid of those and starting to read labels, and start to add in some of those five healthful aspects of food, our lives transform. So, and it really pushes us more towards whole, you know, unprocessed whole foods eating. Um, so that's that's kind of the core of the of where the research led me as I was trying to develop a, a metabolic health food framework that actually works for every dietary philosophy. You could be vegan and mm -hmm. you could follow that, those principles. You could actually be it would be hard to be carnivore because they don't eat a lot of fiber, mm -hmm. but you could certainly be keto, paleo, Mediterranean, and absolutely do all eight of those things. Right. So it's more about principles and cellular biology than diet dogma. Will you talk a little bit about processed foods? Sure. Because I think, I think it's, people are unclear on what's actually processed and what's not. So mm. bread and pastas, and talk a little bit about flours. And what, how, how can we make that easier when we're grocery shopping? There's actually a classification system for the level of processing of food, which is called the NOVA classification, that goes from unprocessed to ultra-processed. And the thing that we want to absolutely get rid of from our diet completely is ultra-processed. And basically what that means is that in a factory somewhere, food was broken down into individual components, 
like little teeny building blocks and then industrial put back together like a little Frankenstein model. So it's taking like a particular component from one food and another and putting together something that our body just has literally no idea what to do with and then often adding synthetic chemicals like colorings, preservatives, fillers that are used to increase taste and to trigger our brain for reward, to increase shelf life, to increase the, the coloring of it, to make it more you know, palatable or, or to make it more enticing in some way. And so those are ultra processed foods and like a, a whole wheat, which is basically you take the wheat and you can like grind it under a stone with a mortar and pestle and make bread. That's not ultra processed because the ingredients, the components haven't actually been stripped apart and put back together in a literally a science fiction way. Whereas Wonder Bread is ultra processed because that actually took the wheat, it ground it, it then removed the bran and it removed the fiber and the nutrients and just kept the germ, the white part essentially. So it took one part and then mixed it with a bunch of other things like sugars and oils and built a Franken food. So those are two very different things. Like if you can grind a piece of wheat and mix it with water and make bread, that's a, that's a processed food, but it's gonna include all components that were in the original food versus an ultra processed food is like this mix and match. And going back to the conversation about inflammation, if we think about inflammation in the body being the body essentially responding to a threat signal, like it's inflammation is essentially biochemical fear in the body on a cellular mm -hmm. level. Well, if you're putting something into the body that was made in a factory that has this mix and match of parts that the body over the literally like hundreds of thousands of years of modern humans have been alive that they've never seen before, it's gonna stimulate the body to be like afraid. And that's literally what's happening. We know that the more ultra processed food that people eat, the more likely they're gonna develop these chronic cardiometabolic diseases. So fully unprocessed is like this, this apple. It's right. like, it came from, that was picked off a tree and nothing Shipped has been you. done. And, and you know, hopefully you picked it straight from the tree and it, you know, didn't travel. And that's great. That's like the best, the best thing you could do if it came from good soil and it was picked today. Minimally processed is when certain things were done to the food to basically, um, you know, make it last longer um, or, you know, have it stored in a particular way, but isn't changing anything about the food itself. So minimally processed foods are canned beans just in water. The, can the bean has been cooked and it's been sealed, but there's no, there's no like um, sugar, there's no salt, there's no other flavorings or things like that. An apple that's been chopped and put in a package, that's minimally processed. It's been changed, but the apple is still all there. And none of these synthetic or artificial components have been added to it. So minimally what? processed, peanut butter would be a minimally processed food if no sugar or palm oil were added to it. It's literally ground mm -hmm. almonds. almonds. So Almond I would say typically we can think of minimally processed foods as totally fine to eat. These kohlrabi noodles are minimally processed because they've been turned into noodles, but nothing's been changed about the kohlrabi. Um, versus the Ezekiel bread is a processed food, mm -hmm. but not an ultra processed food because it's still right. whole grain in there. So I would say we just want to eat yeah. as much unprocessed. I would say pretty much minimally processed is okay almost entirely. It's still going to be farther away from the earth, so probably have lost some of its nutrient value, but it's still, I think, very much conducive with a metabolically healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Processed, we really want to start limiting, and ultra processed, we never want to eat. And you mentioned your book, pairing with exercise. There's some foods that you suggest that you pair with exercise. Talk about that a little bit, what exercise does to help you manage your glucose mm, spiking. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating. If you just take a very short walk or do a little bit of physical activity right after a meal, it significantly decreases your glucose elevation, your blood sugar elevation from that meal. And it can be for as little as like five minutes. 